acclimatization to high altitude. The reduced pressure at high altitude means that although the percentage of air that is oxygen remains the same, the air is thinner and so therefore there are fewer particles of oxygen available for use. Because of this reduction in available oxygen to the body, the body must undergo various changes to adapt. Changes may be beneficial or adverse. The sum of those changes that have a beneficial effect is called acclimatization. It is important to note that it is not just the degree of hypoxia that is important when considering acclimatization, but also the rate. If an aircraft travelling at the height of Everest suddenly depressurized, the passengers on board would probably lose consciousness within a few minutes, whereas someone who has managed to climb to the top of Everest would not only be conscious, but also be able to slowly scale the mountain. Without acclimatization, the first manifestation of hypoxia appears at about 1,500 metres in the form of altered night vision. By 4,000 to 5,000 metres, people begin feeling tingling of fingers and mouth. At altitudes greater than 5,000 metres, some people would begin becoming unconscious, and at greater than 7,000 metres, most people will be unconscious. At the top of Everest, consciousness would only be preserved for approximately two minutes. This shows us not only that acclimatization is necessary for high altitude descent, but also the extent of physiological change involved in acclimatization. To facilitate adequate acclimatization, the recommended rate of ascent at an altitude greater than 3,000 meters is no more than 300 meters a day. This should be accompanied by a rest day after every two to three days of climbing. It is also recommended as an aid to acclimatization that people climb to a higher altitude on their day of rest but return to sleep at the same altitude. Hence the phrase, climb high, sleep low. These guidelines, however, are considered to be too conservative and many people will safely ascend at a faster rate. How quickly individuals acclimatize at altitude varies. As yet, there is no way to determine how successful an individual will be at acclimatization. It may come as a surprise to many that age, gender, and even fitness level have no effect on the rate of acclimatization. In fact, older people appear less susceptible to acute mountain sickness than younger people and seem to acclimatize equally well. The only indicator of how well someone will cope at high altitude is how well they have coped with previous exposure to altitude. It is thought that experienced mountaineers may acclimatize faster than others, but this has not yet been verified. Different aspects of acclimatization occur over varying time periods from months to months and may tend to have a biphasic response. Within months of exposure, there are changes in ventilation and cardiac function, along with the release of a transcription factor called hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha, or HIF-1-alpha. As the name suggests, this is a transcription factor that is released in response to hypoxia that affects over 100 genes. In response to hypoxia of high altitude, the body increases breathing rate in an effort to get more oxygen. With increased ventilation comes an increase in the amount of CO2 being blown off. This decrease in CO2 affects the acid-base balance in the body and causes the body to become alkalotic. To balance the alkalosis and therefore allow the body to continue to hyperventilate to relieve its hypoxia, the kidneys begin to excrete more HCO3- from the body, allowing pH to be returned to normal. With pH in a safe range, the body is free to continue hyperventilating. This oscillating process continues over and back, with the result being an increase in micturition and ventilation. This graph shows the oxygen cascade, both at sea level in purple and at 5,800 metres in blue. 5,800 metres has been chosen because at that height, the atmospheric pressure is half what it is at sea level. The lines in the graph represent the partial pressure of oxygen in air. Atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 milligrams of mercury. As approximately 20% of atmospheric air is oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen at sea level is 20% of 760, or 160 milligrams of mercury. We can see this on the graph as ambient air at sea level. At each point in the process of inspiration of air, the partial pressure of oxygen, or the amount of air that is oxygen, decreases. For each drop, there is a different cause, and we will look at these soon in detail. More important to consider is the fact that the graph at 5,800 meters is not identical to that at sea level, and that many of the drops are less severe. This is crucial for survival at high altitude. Here is a diagram of the human body, with the large red lines representing the mouth, pharynx, larynx, trachea, and large bronchi heading into the lungs. First, let's look at the ambient air. 
We can see here that at sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen is 160 milligrams of mercury. As the atmospheric pressure at 5,800 meters is half that of sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen is also half. Therefore, it's 80 milligrams of mercury. As the air is inhaled through the upper respiratory system, it is heated and humidified. The drop seen in partial pressure of oxygen from the ambient air to the inspired air is due to the addition of water vapour to the inspired air. The water vapour pressure at body temperature is 47 mg of mercury, and this displaces almost 10 mg of mercury of the partial pressure of oxygen. This is an unavoidable loss, and therefore is also 10 mg of mercury at altitude. Continuing on, here we see a bunch of alveoli with an interwinding capillary network. Zooming on in a single alveolus, we can see the partial pressure of oxygen at this stage. The fall off in partial pre pressure at this time occurs due to the addition of carbon dioxide and the uptake of oxygen into the blood. The main thing affecting this figure is alveolar ventilation. If you were to double ventilation, you would half this drop. After acclimatization at 5,800 meters, ventilation is approximately doubled and so the drop at this point is halved, as we can see on the graph. The next drop is mostly caused by ventilation perfusion mismatch. This mismatch is modestly reduced to altitude due to the increase in pulmonary arterial pressure due to hypoxia. Realistically though, this is too small to make any major difference. The change from arterial and venous partial pressure is dependent on a couple of factors, such as the metabolic rate, the cardiac output, and the oxygen carrying capacity of blood, i.e. the haemoglobin concentration. Upon initial exposure to altitude, cardiac output, heart rate, venous tone and blood pressure are all seen to rise due to increased sympathetic stimulation. As time progresses, the heart rate remains elevated while the stroke volume decreases due to 1. The loss of plasma caused by bicarbonate diuresis, 2. Fluid shift from the intravascular space and 3 a decrease in aldosterone. This leads to a lowering of cardiac output back towards normal after some time. On exposure to altitude, the body increases the concentration of haemoglobin in the blood. Initially, the change can be accounted for by the decrease in plasma volume due to bicarbonate diuresis. This causes the blood to be more concentrated with haemoglobin, even though the actual amount of haemoglobin itself hasn't actually increased. HIF1-alpha signals the production of new red blood cells by increasing the EPO levels. This takes about 10 to 14 days. The oxygen dissociation curve is also important. Due to the sigmoid shape of the curve, arterial oxygen saturation is well maintained up to an altitude of 3000 meters. Above this point, small changes in the partial pressure of oxygen result in large changes in the saturation of oxygen due to the steep slope of the curve. Respiratory alkalosis causes left shift in the curve. This effect is mitigated by an increased release of 2,3-DPG from red blood cells in response to the alkalosis. Only at extreme altitudes does this left shift begin to predominate. Left shift is beneficial as it allows blood to take up more oxygen from the lungs. An increase in the concentration of blood vessels in the skeletal muscles is achieved by a combination of muscle atrophy and angiogenesis. There is an increase in nitric oxide synthesis in peripheral tissues leading to a vasodilation and an increase in the blood supply to surrounding tissues. It has been observed that peripheral capillary circulation slows down at high altitude. There is little known about the cause of this. There are a few data looking at how long acclimatization persists or for how long after descending the beneficial changes remain. Anecdotal experience and a little research that has been done suggests that the effect of acclimatization probably falls off exponentially with time over perhaps two or three weeks. Some researchers, however, believe that there is still benefit months later. It has been shown that climbers who were exposed to high altitude over 3,000 metres for four days in the two months preceding another trip to altitude performed better on the second exposure compared with the control group, i.e. they had an increased speed of acclimatisation and lower rates of acute mountain sickness. It is well known that staying at high altitudes for prolonged periods of time can be deleterious for a person's health. This is termed high altitude deterioration. Altitudes above 8,000 metres have been called a death zone and climbers must always plan to keep the time spent at this altitude to a minimum. The cause of the deterioration include dehydration, starvation, physical exhaustion, cold and hypoxia. 
and the manifestations of deterioration include loss of appetite, weight loss, lethargy, fatigue, slowness of thought and poor judgment. In this video we have looked at the rate of acclimatization, looked at the need for acclimatization, predicting factors, timeline, how the body balances pH to allow for hyperventilation, the oxygen cascade, the effect on the cardiovascular system, the oxygen dissociation curve, oxygen delivery, carryover acclimatization and deterioration. Additional information can be found at www.highaltitudemedicine.ie